On the Saturday before Pentecost, in the spring sunshine, people strolled, carefree and unheeding, through the swarming streets. They chatted happily. The children played games on the pavements. With some of my schoolmates, I sat in the Ezra Malalik Gardens, studying a treatise on the Talmud. Night fell. There were 20 people gathered in our backyard. My father was telling them anecdotes and expounding his own views on the situation. He was a very good storyteller. Suddenly, the gate opened and Stern, a former tradesman who had become a policeman, came in and took my father aside. Despite the gathering dusk, I saw my father turn pale. What's the matter? We all asked him. I don't know. I've been summoned to an extraordinary meeting of the council. Something must have happened. The good story he had been in the middle of telling us was to remain unfinished. I'm going there, he went on. I shall be back as soon as I can. I'll tell you all about it. Wait for me. We were prepared to wait for some hours. The backyard became like the hall outside an operating room. We were only waiting for the door to open, to see the opening of the firmament itself. Other neighbors, having heard rumors, had come to join us. People looked at their watches. The time passed very slowly. What could such a long meeting mean? I've got a premonition of evil, said my mother. This afternoon, I noticed some new faces in the ghetto. Two German officers from the Gestapo, I believe. Since we've been here, not a single officer has ever shown himself. It was nearly midnight. No one had wanted to go to bed. A few people had paid a flying visit to their homes to see that everything was all right. Others had returned home, but they left instructions that they were to be told as soon as my father came back. At last, the door opened and he appeared. He was pale. At once, he was surrounded. What happened? Tell us what happened. Say something. How avid we were at that moment for one word of confidence one sentence to say that there were no grounds for fear, that the meeting could not have been more commonplace, more routine, that it had only been a question of social welfare, of sanitary arrangements. But one glance at my father's haggard face was enough. I have terrible news, he said at last. Deportation. The ghetto was to be completely wiped out. We were to leave street by street starting the following day. We wanted to know everything, all the details. The news had stunned everyone. Yet we wanted to drain the bitter draft to the dregs. Where are we being taken? This was a secret. A secret from all except one, the president of the Jewish council. He would not say. He could not say. The Gestapo had threatened to shoot him if he talked. There are rumors going around, said my father in a broken voice that were going somewhere in Hungary to work in the brick factories. Apparently the reason is that the front is too close here. And after a moment's silence, he added, each person will be allowed to take only his own personal belongings, a bag on our backs, some food, a few clothes, nothing else. Again, a heavy silence. Go and wake the neighbors up, said my father, so that they can get ready. The shadows beside me awoke as from long sleep. They fled silently in all directions. For a moment, we were alone. Then suddenly, Badia Reich, a relative who was living with us, came into the room. There's someone knocking on the blocked up window, the one that faces outside. It was not until after the war that I learned who it was that had knocked. It was an inspector in the Hungarian police, a friend of my father. Before we went into the ghetto, he had said to us, don't worry, if you're in any danger, I'll warn you. If he had could have spoken to us that evening, we could perhaps have fled. But by the time we had managed to open the window, it was too late. There was no one outside. The ghetto awoke. One by one, lights came on in the windows. I went into the house of one of my friend's fathers. I woke up the head of the household, an old man with a gray beard in the eyes of a dreamer. He was stooped from long nights of study. 
get up, sir, get up. You've got to get ready for the journey. You're going to be expelled from here tomorrow with your whole family and all the rest of the Jews. Where to? Don't ask me, sir. Don't ask me any questions. Only God could answer you. For heaven's sake, get up. He had not understood a word of what I was saying. He probably thought I had gone out of my mind. What tale is this? Get ready for the journey? What journey? Why? What's going on? Have you gone mad? Still, half asleep, he stared at me with terror-stricken eyes, as though he expected me to burst out laughing and say in the end, Get back into bed. Go to sleep. Pleasant dreams. Nothing's happened at all. It was just a joke. My throat was dry. The words choked in it, paralyzing my lips. I could not say any more. Then he understood. He got out of bed and with automatic movements began to get dressed. Then he went up to the bed where his wife slept and touched her brow with infinite tenderness. She opened her eyes and it seemed to me that her lips were brushed by a smile. Then he went to his children's beds and woke them swiftly, dragging them from their dreams. I fled. Time passed very quickly. It was already four o'clock in the morning. My father ran to right and left, exhausted, comforting friends, running to the Jewish council to see if the edict had not been revoked in the meantime. To the very last moment, a germ of hope stayed alive in our hearts. The women were cooking eggs, roasting meat, baking cakes, and making knapsacks. The children wandered all over the place, hanging their heads, not knowing what to do with themselves, where to go, to keep from getting in the way of the grown-ups. Our backyard had become a real marketplace. Household treasures, valuable carpets, silver candelabra, prayer books, Bibles, and other religious articles littered the dusty ground beneath a wonderfully blue sky. Pathetic objects, which looked as though they had never belonged to anyone. By eight o'clock in the morning, a weariness like molten lead began to settle in the veins, the limbs, the brain. I was in the midst of my prayers when suddenly there were shouts in the street. I tore myself from my phylacteries and ran to the window. Hungarian police had entered the ghetto and were shouting in the neighboring street. All Jews, outside, hurry! Some Jewish police went into the houses, saying in broken voices, The time's come now. You've got to leave all this. The Hungarian police struck out with trunkins and rifle butts to right and left without reason, indiscriminately their blows falling upon old men and women, children and invalids alike. One by one, the houses emptied, and the street filled with people in bundles. By 10 o'clock, all the condemned were outside. The police took a roll call once, twice, 20 times. The heat was intense. Sweat streamed from faces and bodies. Children cried for water. Water? There was plenty close at hand in the houses and the yards, but they were forbidden to break the ranks. Water, mummy, water! The Jewish police from the ghetto were able to go and fill a few jugs secretly. Since my sisters and I were destined for the last convoy and we were still allowed to move about, we helped them as well as we could. Then, at last, at one o'clock in the afternoon, came the signal to leave. There was joy, yes, joy. Perhaps they thought that God could have devised no torment in hell worse than that of sitting there among the bundles in the middle of the road beneath a blazing sun that anything would be preferable to that. They began their journey without a backward glance at the abandoned streets, the dead, empty houses, the gardens, the tombstones. On everyone's back was a pack, and everyone's eyes was suffering drowned in tears. Slowly, heavily, the procession made its way to the gate of the ghetto.